yeah, I mean, they're shouting, but if they knew my situation, do you really know the math? I mean, they say God will provide, but what about the numbers? I mean, what do they think of me? We got here late. Is God mad at me? Will it really work for me? I'm so glad the kids are out of school. But wait, what am I going to do with them in the summer? Will I have the money? They're letting folks off at my job. Will I be let go? I mean, you know, am I starting to feel anxious? I'm sneezing. Do I have, do I need to Google COVID symptoms? I mean, maybe it's because I'm a woman. Maybe it's because I'm a man. Maybe it's because I'm white or because I'm black. Or maybe it's because I'm Hispanic. I don't fit in. Or maybe it's because my father wasn't there. Or maybe it's because I'm not educated enough. If I'd only gotten that degree, but I couldn't get the degree because, well, and then the money. And so, but I thought God would, I'm never going to make it. No one will ever show up for church. I mean, it's a pandemic and what's going to happen? And Another sermon, Lord, are you really going to speak? Are you really going to do what you promised? Would you really save my son? Like, I mean, God, he's on drugs and this is bad and I, I don't really know. Would any of you this morning, online or in the room, would you be willing to admit that your thoughts can seem to have a life of their own? If I could take a look and turn on the lights in your mind this morning, what would we really hear? Would we hear what you present in the light? Or would we hear what really happens in your mind? If you're honest online or this morning, you can begin to realize that it's almost as if my thoughts have a life of their own. And that's why this morning we're going to start a new series as we kick off this summer at Nikeo talking about the title Thought Life. Thought Life. Because here's the catch. If we don't control our thought life, your thoughts will control your life. If you don't control your thoughts, your thoughts will control your life. Romans 12 verse 2 teaches us to not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will. And right off the bat this morning, I want to challenge some of you. What level of living are you on with God? Are you in the good level or are you on the pleasing level or are you on the perfect will of God level? Where are you on a continuum? Maybe you're far from God. But here's what I've learned through the Bible over time and through study is that the level of your life will never supersede the level of your thoughts. The level of your life will never supersede the level of your thoughts. We just got finished with a series called Watch Your Mouth and we said that you can't walk in victory and talk in defeat. Well, here's the catch. You won't talk in victory if you think in defeat. So if we're going to really change our talk, we're going to have to change our thoughts. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7 says that very thing. That as a man or woman thinketh, as you think in your heart, so are you. In other words, what we think determines who we become. If you think you can't, you probably won't. If you think you can, by the grace of God, you probably will. It'll never work. It won't. 
it'll work for my good. It will. If you think like a victim, you will live like a victim. If you think like a victor, you will walk in victory. Because we can't at Nikeo online, I can't talk to you about victory this morning and let you stay thinking in defeat. I can't live positively and think negatively. And here's how I would say it to you. The life we have is a direct reflection of the thoughts we think. The life we have is a direct reflection of the thoughts we think. And I want to say it to you this morning like this, and we're going to pray, and we're going to jump in to this sermon. But here is a truth that I need you to hear, and through the next four weeks, I need you to consider daily. Your life will always move in the direction of your most dominant thought. Let me say it again. Your life will always move in the direction of your most dominant thought, your strongest thought. So in other words, my life will always move. Not sometimes, always. You are always moving, even if it's subtle, in the direction of your most dominant thought, because as a man or woman thinketh, so are they. We don't believe that because we think we automatically become it right away. But actually, it's, we could say, so as a man or woman thinks in their heart, so are they becoming day by day. So if I think God thoughts, I'm going to move in the direction God has in my life. If I begin to be consumed and think with anxious and worried and negative thoughts, I'm going to begin to move away from the direction and the good, pleasing, and perfect will. Because your life will always move in the direction of your most dominant thought. If that is true, and it is, then here's the question I want you to ponder with God. Do you like the direction your life is headed? Do you like where your life is headed? Well, pastor, I don't know where my life is headed. Yes, you do. Listen, your life is headed where your head is. Where are you headed? Where is your head? Where are you headed? What will tomorrow, where are you headed? Because where the mind goes, the man follows. Where the mind goes, the woman goes. So if you do not like where your thoughts are, you're not going to like where your life goes. So what we have to do, number one in this series, and over the next four weeks, we're going to begin to dig at and into our thought life so that we can control our thoughts and our thoughts not control our lives. And so here's what we have to do. Number one, we have to understand the power of your thinking. I know that may not be the most creative title for those of you online, but here's the truth. You, if you do not understand the power of your thinking, you will never realize the power of your thinking. I want you to do me a favor. Let's bow your head for a moment online in the room. And I want us to ask the Holy Spirit before we even say another word to come. We ask you and worship God to come and overwhelm us. And God, my prayer is that we wouldn't just be overwhelmed with emotion or overwhelmed with a worship song. God, I pray we would be overwhelmed with your presence. God, I pray you would even begin day one of this series to begin to overwhelm the negative thoughts in our mind, to begin to overwhelm the anxiety, to begin to overwhelm the depression, that even as we begin to speak the truth of your word, that you would begin to set captives free. God, that you would begin to change and transform our minds by the renewing of them through your word. 
And God, we, no matter where we are, if we're far from you, would come back to you this morning. If we've never met you fully, we would begin to know you. And God, if we're just walking in an okay place, we would go from good to God and to begin to please you and walk in the perfect will that you have for us. So God, speak to us. Teach us like only you can. Because God, we realize that the life we have is actually a reflection of the thoughts we think. So God, in these next few minutes, teach us about the power of our thinking. In Jesus' name, we all said together, come on, I want you to say amen loud. Amen. Online, say amen. And here's what we're trying to do. Let me, let me get it real. Let me wake you all up for a second. Tell somebody beside you, get your mind right. Put in the chat, type in the chat real quick. Get your mind right. We told you to watch your mouth. We tell this, I just get your mind right. I, I, I wanted to make it a little more, little more strategic and more eloquent uh, with the, the, the series title, but we should have just said, watch your mouth and get your mind right. And, but if people didn't know us, they might think we a little, come on, praise the Lord. We're, we're saying we got to get our mind right because where our mind goes, our life will go. And the reality is when we talk about the power of our thinking, we really don't know what our thoughts do. What do our thoughts actually do? The reality is, church, if you begin to understand, number one, the startling effects of the power of your thinking, it'll wake you up to think about what you think about. Amen. And here's number one. Both, let's, I'm not even going to start with scripture today. I'm going to start with science. I'm going to start with science. And here's what I would want you to know. That neuroscience right off the bat is not counter to God's word, it is actually beginning to prove God's word true. So in fact, I've done a little bit of research and I've walked in this journey for a little bit, but cognitive behavioral psychology proves that many of the problems we face are a direct result of our thought processes, relational challenges, eating disorders, addictions, forms of anxiety, physical disease, heart conditions, back aches, mental disorders, many, in fact, a lot of those are a direct result of the thoughts we think. In fact, what you have to realize is that your thoughts are not just thoughts. Your thoughts are alive. They contain chemical energy. And every time you think a thought, you, your thought is chemically and physically changing your brain. Your brain is not a fixed structure. Your brain is actually a muscle. See, we don't think like our brain is like our bicep, but your brain is very similar, but very different at the same time. In other words, you have to be careful that you don't assume your brain equals your mind. Because if you think your brain is your mind, you think it can't change. What the reality is, is if you change your thoughts, you can change your mind, which can begin to change your brain. And so the reality is every thought you think is sending energy to your brain, which creates literally what's crazy is it looks like a tree in your brain. It's called a thought tree. If we took a, a, sci, a neuroscience, we took a brain scan, we could see the thoughts on your thing. And here's the question, is your mind a forest that you can't see through? Or is it a mind that has been renewed with the word, the mind of Christ that is clear that you can see God's will to? It's called very much what it does is a neural pathway. It's a neural pathway. In my yard right now, um, I, I put this, these steps down the side of the house because the church office is back in our basement to save money. We didn't want to go get an expensive lease in this season. And if God knows we're believing for a building, so we didn't want to go sign some little bitty, oh, we didn't want to sign a little bitty office lease. And then the reason we can't get a building is because we tied to a little bitty lease. And so we, we just said, hey, we're going to pack in the basement. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, and hallelujah. So I put some steps down 
And, and part of it was that I already knew where the path should be because I have some neighbors who like to use the middle of my house and their house as the cut through to their basement. Yeah, that's offensive, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Get on your side. Praise the Lord. But they don't want to do that because there's trees and animals on the other side of their house. So they go between the houses, and over the years, what has happened is I didn't have to put stones down because there was already a path that had been traveled. And here's what a neural pathway is. Every time you think a thought, it makes it easier for you to think that thought again. So I'm creating a neural pathway in my mind. So every time I think I'm not able because I was abused or I can't do it because I don't have that degree. Every time you think that you've traveled that path. And for some of you, you've traveled the path so long that you don't realize that you've created a pathway, which is why it is so hard sometimes to think opposite of the thought that you currently think. And what's more is when your thoughts go, the chemical energy, when it happens, one of the things that happens is there is chemicals in your body that are released through your brain that tell you that thought is either working or not. Yeah. One of those is called dopamine. Yeah. Dope, I mean. <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. I'm trying to help you remember it. Because what you don't realize is dopamine is as addictive as dope. When I feel overweight and out of shape and I don't feel good about myself, my old pathway says, let me walk to the refrigerator and eat some ice cream. Mine says, I'm tired, so let me get some dark chocolate and some coffee. But every time I do that, I cut a path. And I want to go cut that path some more because when I walk down that path, at the end of it, I got a dopamine hit. And dopamine is a happy hormone. It's a drug. It's a, it's a legal drug. And so I say, oh, the ice cream brought me relief. But it didn't bring me release. So what we have to do is when we start not to feel the healthiest, when we start to feel I don't like how I look and oh my gosh, and I, no one's going to want to be with me and who, where's my Boaz? Why would Boaz come looking for Ruth when she look a mess? Uh, I, I don't know. And so you start to have these thoughts that you don't tell anybody. Yeah. But instead of going down the old path, we need to cut a new path yeah. that says I'm going to go outside and take a walk. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow in spite of how I feel. And then when you're done with the walk, you get not just the dopamine, but you get other hormones, that serotonin and things released in you that says, ah, that was right. And you don't just get relief, you get over time a release from the previous pathway that would lead you down the wrong path. So the question is, are you stuck in a mental rut? Do you feel like you can't get out? That's not just a bad thought. Do not be conformed any longer to the listen pattern. It's a pattern. It's a pathway. It's a neural pathway. And you have to learn that when you're feeling unsettled, what is your pathway? When you get, I'm unsettled, so I immediately go to social media, which gives me a hit of dopamine. My goodness. And not even realizing that now when I'm actually with my family or my spouse, I don't even realize it, but I'm so addicted to the pattern of the pathway that I'm not experiencing the life in my relationships not because of necessarily the phone, but because of where and why I pick it up because my thoughts say, 
Is anybody in the room? This is some of the science, and I don't have time or nor the degree to begin to really educate you, but there are a lot of people out there. I would tell you in this series, if you wanted to do some outside study on your own, the number one resource I would give you is a woman named Dr. Caroline Leaf. Dr. Caroline Leaf, she is a Christian neuroscientist with more degrees than a thermometer. She is a woman of God, spirit-filled, but has more degrees than a thermometer and will begin to show you how you can change your brain by, and change your mind together to begin to rewire uh, what's going on in your mind. And so she can give you the science, but here's what I want to do. I want to tell you how scripture says it. Because scripture and science say it together, and we already mentioned it, but as you think in your heart, so are you. What you think determines what you have. What you think determines who you are. What you think determines who you'll become. And if that is true, that the, the science can affect it this way, and the, the scripture says it this way, that in other words, my life and my victory is determined by my thought life. That your victory will never go higher and greater than you think it will. If that's true, then it's not just a startling effect, it's actually number two, spiritual warfare. What do our thoughts do? If our thoughts can make us sick, if our thoughts can make us depressed, if our thoughts can make us suicidal, if our thoughts can make us have relational challenges, eating disorders, anxiety, stress, struggles, and if our thoughts can keep and determine the level of our life by the level of our thoughts, behind that is an attack. It is actually spiritual warfare. And what you have to know, startling effect number two, is that the mind is the battlefield where spiritual warfare is fought. The mind is the battlefield where spiritual warfare is fought. And most of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. Ephesians 2.2 2 says... Don't, don't do this any longer in what you once walked according to the course of this world. According, listen, to the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. The airwaves. Which tells you right off the bat, I need you to understand that every thought you think doesn't come from you. That every thought you think does not come from you. That the enemy is determined to whisper and speak and subtly show you and bring up a post that would make you question. And you read it and you're like, are they talking about you? What are they doing? Are they, are, are they this? You walk in a room and you see your spouse on the phone. It's not just you who says, what are they doing? It's the enemy who says, I wonder if you can trust them. I wonder. It's not just you who thinks, oh, I, I, can I really join a church and get connected because church people are this? It's the enemy who's whispering. And really quickly, this is not in my notes, but let me teach you something. The enemy doesn't announce himself as the enemy. Do you realize snakes hide in the grass? So in the, in the garden, when we first see the devil come on the scene to introduce a thought to Eve, what was he disguised as? A serpent. And he, he, he didn't announce himself as the enemy. He disguised himself as a serpent and as a friend. Hey, you're missing something. Hey, you, maybe God's withholding something from you. Maybe you should have it by now. Maybe it's better than you thought. Maybe you can, one time won't hurt you. You won't surely die. Hey, everybody else is doing it. How can you, no, you can't love and not do this. You can't. In other words, the enemy will disguise his voice as you and almost often as God. And you have to know that when it seems like your thoughts have a life of their own, there's multiple voices speaking. There's your thoughts, there's God's thoughts, there's the enemy's thoughts, 
And then there's the thoughts of the people that you place around you, which the enemy can use because he's the prince of the power of the air. And I, I don't want to even go here because I'll get stuck and I won't, I won't finish the sermon. But parents, we have to be very careful to realize that the enemy is the prince of the power of the air. So I got to be careful what airwaves I put in my house. And it's summer. Pastor Tamika and I already had a meeting. It's summer. What these kids are not going to do while we downstairs working, they are not going to be on an iPad and on TV and YouTube's going to raise my kids because I don't know what commercial is going to show up. I don't know what fear. I don't know what thing. And here's the reality. You can tell me you don't believe that, but then do you really believe today that the Spirit of God can touch you through the airwaves of technology? Because you can't believe one without the other. And so we have to realize that it's spiritual warfare, the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians 6 tells us, finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So take on, verse 17 says, the helmet of salvation. Why do you need a helmet if something's not trying to hit you in the head? And listen, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Second Corinthians 10 chapter three says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Excuse me, on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Everybody say strongholds. strongholds. We're going to come back to that in a moment. But we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Listen, and we take captive every thought, every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So what kind of war are we fighting? Not one that the world's fighting. We're fighting a war against the enemy spiritually who is determined to attack you on the battlefield of your mind. And the level of your victory will be determined by the level of your thinking, which is actually spiritual warfare. So it's startling effects. What do our thoughts do? They have some startling effects. The the, the thought, the power of thought is, um, is, is amazing. But it's also spiritual warfare And the goal of that spiritual warfare, number three, what do your thoughts do? And I had you say it. You were helping me preach and didn't know it. It's a stronghold. The goal of your enemy with your thoughts is to create a stronghold in your mind. Well, pastor, what's a stronghold? Stronghold comes from a military term, which was a place that they would build to to guard. It's a guard or a garrison. It's a place that would keep the enemy out or keep prisoners in. And back in old times, literally the, the, the walls of that stronghold would, could be dug as deep as 20 feet in the ground. When I read that, I couldn't help but think how deep the neural pathways must go in our mind. Why? Because the stronghold is there to keep the prisoner in or keep the opposing force out. And here's what it means mentally. It literally means a prisoner locked by deception. That is the spiritual definition of a stronghold. A prisoner locked by deception. A prisoner locked by deception. Just recently, uh, I believe the Friday before Memorial Day, uh, our, our, our fitness program had us do the Murph Challenge. And we, they just had us do a half Murph, not a whole Murph. That's this CrossFit challenge where you, you run a mile, you do 300, um, 300 squats, 300 pull-ups or something, 150 pull-ups, 300 squats, and 300 um, push-ups, and a run a mile, and, and all within the, for time. And so I was like, good gracious. And so Pastor Tamika did it earlier than I did, and I was like, well, she's not going to beat me, Keith, because I can't, you know, I can't punk out, so I got to set the example in my house. And so I was like, well, I got to run, but I'm supposed to walk the dog and take out this stuff. So I was like, I'm going to run with the dog. And so I took little Nikki, uh, which is, she's our little golden doodle, mini golden doodle. Y'all pray for us, uh, Nikki and Kayo Nikayo. And so Nikki is about 14 pounds, but Nikki, 
like she likes to mush like she's a sled dog. It's like, I'm going to run with Nikki because I can wear her out. And if I get a little tired, she might pull me a little bit. She's strong. And I was dying after all them push-ups and pull-ups and <laughs> squats. Help me, Jesus. And so I'm running down the street. I'm about a co- half a mile in. I got about another half mile. And all of a sudden, we see a dog in the yard, a big border collie. And she come, ran, up, ran up to the edges, like, arr, arr, showing his teeth. I'm like, this dog going to eat Nikki. And the owner ran out and was like, it's okay. I'm like, what do you mean it's okay? Your dog's about to eat my dog for lunch. And he said, no, 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 it's okay. She won't go past the fence. And I looked at him for a moment real slow because I was like, what fence? And I was like, I don't see a fence. And he said, it's an invisible fence. I said, oh, one of those. I said, does it work? He said, sometimes. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, how, because we, we need to get one for her probably then. And, and so he said, he said, she won't go past it today because she's been trained by it. I was like, wait, how do they train them to use it? He said, it's simple. The first day they install the fence, they give the dog a strong shock when you walk them by it. And he said, once they get that shock enough on the first day, they won't go near that line any longer. And I said, well, so you're telling me that right now this dog won't cross this line? He said, no, doesn't want to get shocked. And he said to me this crazy thing. He said, but what she doesn't know is that it's not even on anymore. And when I heard that, I realized that that is exactly where many of us are this morning. Jesus has set us free. He has taken away the sting of death and the law. We're free. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But we're not walking in that freedom because we're still fenced by an invisible thing in our minds that has made us a prisoner yet only locked by deception to think that I can't go past this level when reality I've already been set free and the fence has been turned off. Could this morning you be living with a mental stronghold and don't even know it? Could you be a prisoner locked by deception? But here's the problem with this question I just asked you. The nature of deception is that you don't know you're deceived. Because if you knew you were deceived, you would not be deceived. So let me help you real quick define some ways that we have been deceived by the enemy to keep us in spiritual mental strongholds. Number one, we, we've been deceived by the enemy that we don't know that we even have a stronghold. Pastor, are you making sense? Yes. Because if you don't think that you can be deceived, you're deceived. And just because you're functioning doesn't mean you're flourishing. See, the invisible fence is the same thing they do to an, to an elephant at the zoo. There's no zoo in the world that can keep an elephant bound. There's no chain strong enough. There's no little fence wire great enough. If the elephant determined in his mind, he he about to break up out of here. They ain't put no peanuts on my books. I'm out of here. If he decided that he was going free, there's nobody that could stop him. But how do they do it? That when they first bring him, they put a chain around the elephant's leg and they make him walk only in a circle. And then over time, after they have trained him by the chain, they take off the chain and guess where the the elephant won't go beyond. So can I just teach you something real quick? Was Was the chain the stronghold? See, you think 
Break every chain, break every chain. But we need to do more than just break every chain. We need to break the stronghold as well. Because the stronghold wasn't in the chain. It was in the way his brain was trained. So here's my point. Just because the elephant thinks he's free doesn't mean he's not fenced. And what I'm telling you is that there are many of you that are living life at a level that seems blessed. But you haven't seen anything yet. There's a level that you pray at that is not even God's will for you. There's a level that you expect that's not even God's faith for you. Which is why the scripture says that we serve a God who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or imagine. Your, the level of your life will never supersede the level of your so if I think at a level, thank God for grace to take me beyond it. But what if I increase the level? Just because you're functioning doesn't mean you're flourishing. And just because you're doing well doesn't mean there's not more for you. And I wonder if the enemy hasn't re released you to a point to make you think you're free but only to keep you behind the invisible fence. Don't know. I don't know I'm deceived. Could you be limited by your thinking and not even know it? Right. Number two, the enemy deceives us with this concept, outside in. Outside in. Say that. Say outside in. Outside. That's a lie from the pit of hell. What do you mean? Well, what we think is if I can change the circumstance... Then I'll change, then, then my countenance can change. We think if I can change the person, then my perception would change. We think if I could change the problem, then my perspective would change. In other words, we think if we could change the thing, we could change our feeling. And so we try to start working change in our life outside in. And so we spend all of our life, listen, trying to control the uncontrollable. And controlling the uncontrollable is a recipe in mental anguish, anxiety, and depression. Because we're trying to control life when there's only one author of life. You're literally trying to control the circumstances. So if I can just get everything to go well, if I can just clean the house and get all the houses, if I could just make the kids and this and this, the one day when everything's going to be right, I'll be all right. Do you realize that with the one day where everything's going to be all right, you ain't going to be alive? Yes. <laughs> and you're trying to create heaven. When the word teaches to transform your life by first renewing your So true life change doesn't happen outside in. It happens inside out. That if I can renew my mind with the word, then I will be able to test and approve his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So don't spend your time working outside in. Spend your time working inside out. I may not be able to change my spouse, but I can change my response to them. I may not be able to change my children, but I can change how I love them. I can change how I pray. I may not be able to change the racism in my country, but I can definitely change how I view the... Th yeah. <laughs> be transformed by the renewing of your mind, not the perfecting of your situation. And some of us think that if I can get the situation to be right, if I can get them to change, then I will be okay. And it's a recipe in exhaustion, anxiety, and I'm telling you, depression. And ultimately suicide because you'll throw in the towel. So I have to begin to not control the uncontrollables. I have to begin to control the controllables by the grace of God. So what can I control? My countenance. 
So rather than ask for my circumstance to change and then my countenance change, I'll change my countenance, which will ultimately change how I experience my circumstance. So in other words, rather than wait for the situation to change before I rejoice, I'll do what the word says and begin to rejoice in all things. And as I begin to rejoice in all things, the way I experience all things will begin to change. Rather than wait for the new thing, I'll begin to be grateful for the things I have and the gratitude I have will change my attitude towards what I don't have. So I I don't try to change my circumstance, I change my countenance. When I'm dealing with a person, I don't try to change the person, I change my perception. Rather than see them as a person just sent to annoy the mess out of me, I start to say, God, what are you teaching me through them? God, while they're not doing what I want them to do, could it be that you're using them to work on me? Is there something in me that needs to change that would unlock in them what needs to take place? If I always look and it's them, I literally begin to never change as a victor because victim is controlled by the circumstance or the person. So I'll change my perception, which will ultimately change my interaction with the person, which would then change how I interact. Oh, God. I, don't, I don't try to focus on the problem. I change my perspective about it. You know what? I'm going through this. I'm going through this. You, you know what? You're exactly right. You don't prophesy the right thought. Yeah. I'm going through. I'm going through. No, no, no. Change your perspective. To I'm going through. I'm going through. And I'm not just going through. I'm growing through. Yeah. See, when I begin to change that, it begins to change. How I don't wake up like, oh, Lord. I begin to. I'm, no, no, let's fight in the name because not the problem changed. My perspective changed. And here's my point. The current state of our lives is less about what's happening around us and more about what's happening inside of us. And here's the key. That's exactly what God wants. Because God cares more about your character than your comfort. Okay. The goal of this earth is not for you to have everything go the way you want. The goal of this earth is for you to begin to be transformed into His image and His likeness. Number three, stronghold that has us locked and we don't even know it especially in this generation and especially because we're so smart is that we're defined by the very stronghold that we're trying to be delivered from let me say it again we're defined by and let me be even more clear we've defined ourselves by the very stronghold we need to be delivered from what do you mean pastor we begin to say stuff like, this is how I am. This is who I am. This is how I've always been. This is how God made me. And so when we attach something to our personality, we allow it to become our identity. But here's the reality of your personality. Yes, God may have given you that personality, but your personality is constantly being shaped. But it could be shaped in a way that God never meant it to be shaped. So here's the point. You can't say, I'm just high strung. But pastor, I am just high strung. I'm high strung, so I'm wired to be this way. God knew he made me this way. Yeah, but just because he made you high functioning doesn't mean he wants you to be high strung. Because listen, God knows the truth about your identity even more than you have identified with your personality. Is it, can you hear me? I'm sorry, I can't hear up here, I'm sorry. Listen, follow me, stay with me, stay with me, church. I'm a type A personality, so I just like to control things. Okay, yeah, that's a part of your personality to be diligent and administrative and to be thinking, but when that goes beyond God's identity for you, which says, don't be anxious about. And here's my point. When you over-spiritualize your stronghold, you will never be free. 
When you are, I, I, I'm just, a, I'm just, I'm a, dis, I'm a discerning person. No, you're suspicious and wounded and you live in isolation, not because you have a gift of discernment, but because you're suspicious. I even was taught in church and ministry that, that creative people and musicians and, and people were just messy because they were gifted. Where in the scripture did the Levites get to be messy with the temple? And what I'm saying is that God's identity for you may rub up against the personality you currently identify with. And one of them things has to change. Because if your personality is your identity, then your identity has become your God. Rather than your God define your identity. But here's the problem. It goes back to the beginning. Because this is the essence of a stronghold. Is that if you live a lie long enough, it becomes truth to you. So if I live the lie of people always hurt me, I can't trust people. People always trust me, I can't hurt, I, I hurt people, people hurt me, but I'm discerning. I, I'm not getting in that small group because I'm discerning. I, I'm not joining a church yet, I go to different churches, I listen online because I'm discerning. And you have just over-spiritualized the lie. And if you think that people always hurt you and you can never trust anybody, guess what's going to happen? You can't trust anybody and people always hurt you. So I never even get into a situation in which somebody could love me and somebody could not try to hurt me. So I stay away from it and it, then it becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. But I've lived that lie so long that it actually becomes the truth to me. And now I'm even more determined because I actually believe it's the truth. And so I'm just strong, I'm even more strongly held by the stronghold because the stronghold has become my truth. And let's make it real plain. All of our personalities as human is sinful. Thank you, sir. All of our personalities as humans is sinful. You're born with a temper. You're born selfish. What do babies come out saying? First words, now, mine, mine, no. Who taught them to be that way? Their humanity, their personality. But you as a parent don't allow their current personality to let, let them shape their identity in their house. You teach them, you don't tell me no. You share. You shape on them how to think based on their humanity, which was their default setting. Here's what I'm saying. God should be able to tell you how he made you, how he wants you to be. Well, I, I'm just angry. This is how I was raised. My personality, I'm just a little quick tempered. I got a quick trigger. I got a quick trigger. I'm just a little, I don't, you know, I don't show love like that. I'm from the street, pastor. You don't even understand. I hear you, but I ain't with that at church stuff because you don't know how I was raised. I feel you. But God said to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which would mean that he also says to not do any of these other things, which means to be quick tempered because the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. So in other words, he says your new identity from your rebirth. Be careful defining yourself by anything other than who God says you are. Whether it's your personality or not. Because your personality can change and probably should change. If your personality is the same as you were the day you got saved, then you, I don't want to say that because that's strong. But I question your conversion experience. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying have you let the Holy Spirit begin to work in you and sanctify you through and through? If you got the same mouth that you did when you got, before you got saved, if you got the same proclivities, if you got the same, I might have had a quick temper then, but I need to have over time with God, I should begin to have it because I'm not defined by who I used to be. And lastly, here's the deception that, that we all fall into, that there's nothing I can do. Because the reality is the rut can make it feel beyond you. If you got down in a hole, it can feel like your thoughts are quicksand. 
and I just can't get out. I can't change. But the moment you believe that there's nothing you can do about the thoughts that are presented to you is the moment you are stuck by the thoughts that come to you. God didn't just leave us helpless when it came to our thinking. He didn't. What kind of God would that be to know that your thoughts have the power to control your life, but then he didn't give you the power to control your thoughts? He doesn't just say, change it, be transformed, and not help you do it. In fact, he doesn't just help you do it. He gives you the very power to not just control your thoughts, but to completely renew your mind so that you can be transformed. In other words, he doesn't just give you the power to make it better. He gives you the power to make it new. To create new pathways. To begin to think and have the mind of Christ. And so, Pastor, if there's something I can do, then number one, what, what, what do my thoughts do? Number two, what must I do with my thoughts? What must I do with my thoughts? I wish I had time to tell you, but I don't. So I'll give you the abbreviated version, and you can write it down and begin to do it. What must I do with my thoughts? Two things. Ready to write it down? Number one, I must recognize the lie. Because if I'm a prisoner locked by deception, the first step to being free is to realize that I'm being deceived by a lie. So I must figure out the lie. And here's what I want you to do. We're not going to do it. We were going to do it. But I want you today to leave here this week. Here's your homework to give yourself a thought audit, a thought audit. Some of you hear audit get nervous because you hear the IRS. <laughs> but you know how they go through every single line? You need to go through every single thought. And here's what I'm saying, on a continuum, on a continuum. So thinking in my mind, do I think more death and negative? Like when I wake up, is my first thought like, oh man, what's going to happen today? Rather than when I drop the kids off, am I thinking, man, they're going to learn so much today. They're going to grow. Or am I thinking, I hope they just don't get COVID today. I hope. Where on, is it death? Is it life? Is it negative? Is it positive? And, and it's not one or the other. It can fall on a continuum. Is it, is it confident in God? Or is it, uh, uh, I'm just full of fear and anxious? Is it, is, it, is it anxiety and fear or is it faithful? Like where are your thoughts are at, at, in a general consensus? Where do you fall in the thinking realm? Are your thoughts more worldly? Are, are you more concerned daily with who, what you wear, where you go, how much money you make, what's going to happen, what you drive, if we can pay the bills, or are you more concerned with, Lord, what, what do you want me to leave in the earth? Lord, this job is its purpose for me. So when I go here, I'm not just getting this check to get this new car. Lord, what? When, 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 are you more concerned with who liked your post? Filtering the photo? Or are you more concerned with, Lord, how are you going to use me today? Where's your thoughts? Because Romans 8 gives you a very simple key to a thought audit. It says that those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. And here's the ultimate question as you get your thought audit. At the end of an audit, there comes a report. They report to you the findings. Here's what we're looking for. I am looking for the Holy Spirit to reveal in you your most dominant thought. And I want to be very specific, your most dominant stronghold. Pastor, you trying to say I have a stronghold? I'm saying I want you and the Holy Spirit 
to identify the invisible fence in your life? What is the thing that you have yet to go beyond? For some of you, it may, be, it may be that you don't even believe that God's able. For others of you, it may be that you believe that he's able, but he won't do this. That, that, that I, can, I, can, I can do okay here, but I can't do this. When he said I can do all things. So we've just identified that this is your stronghold. That I'm a type A, they'll hurt. You have to identify with God. What is your dominant stronghold? I'm not looking for 10, I'm looking for one. What's the lie to you? Is it that you'll never be enough? The, all the, the enemy can say it 15 ways, but is, what's the lie? Is it that you're not cared for? Is it that you'll never be loved? Is it that you'll never measure up? You're not enough. What's the lie from the pit of hell to keep you fenced in? Here's why. You can't defeat what you don't define. You can't defeat what you won't define. You can't heal what you won't reveal. And so to find that lie, you're gonna have to be vulnerable. But many of us are not even willing to do the thought audit because it will require us to be too vulnerable and realize that we might get exposed because we're so busy trying to make our life look like it's good while we fight in our minds. But what if you could be free in your mind and free in your life? Are you willing to be vulnerable enough to admit that there's something in me that's not thinking like God wants me to think? I'll raise my hand. I'll tell you what there is. God will challenge you. He will push you because you may not even realize that the enemy has fenced you in. And if you're going to find it, you got to be vulnerable. But listen to me quickly. You have to embrace the gift of discomfort. Let me say this again. The gift, everybody say the gift of discomfort. Pastor, discomfort's a gift? Absolutely. When you start to be discomforted and discontented, when you start to have things that go wrong, your, your headaches come, your back's hurting, or you're starting to think depressed thoughts or these situations, your body is giving you an indicator your mind, those depressed thoughts, those that, that, that they're not just there, they're signals. It's a gift that I'm the, uh, when you start to feel uncomfortable around people, you have to embrace that gift. See, what we do in church is we just reject how we feel. But studies show in neuroscience, Dr. Leaf will teach you that to reject the very thought and the way you're feeling is actually to embed it further. Let me say it again. When you just reject it, it's not there, it's not there. You literally reject it further. And then what you do is you walk the path more times saying, it's not like that, it's not like that. No, 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 no. And every time you do, you, you're basically living a lie by saying it's not, and so you just embed it further. So you have to embrace that something, something, something just ain't right. But listen, your feelings should not be ignored, but they also should not be placed in charge. They should not be ignored. They should be embraced for what they are. A signal, a check engine light for my soul. Not the navigator of my life. So I identify the lie. Through embracing the discomfort and getting vulnerable saying, yeah, you know what? When I come up against this situation, I start to feel really, really insecure. If I reject, I'm not, I'm never, no, I'm never, never, I never feel like that. <laughs> okay, stay bound. You don't have to tell everybody, but you have to be honest with God and realize that this, I can be cool on one platform, but another platform, my trust in God gets a little shaky. So maybe that platform is now where my limit is. And lastly, so I recognize the lie with a thought audit and a report. And lastly, number two, very simple, but said simply, yet difficultly lived. I renew with the truth. I renew with the truth. Pastor, why'd you say that's difficult? Because I want you to hear me. Renewing your mind with the truth is not a one moment thing. It's a process. And some of us think that we're gonna take God's word and make it a magic pill for our minds. In other words, you're gonna be 
30 years of abuse and 30 years of a stronghold and you're going to hear one 30 minute message and your life will forever be different. Now pause, I believe that God can touch your mind in an instant. Don't you get it twisted. God can deliver you in an instant. But there is a process after that deliverance. God can turn off the fence in a moment, but you walking free outside of the fence is a process. Are you willing to do the work to renew your mind with the truth of God's word? Because John 8, 32, and I'm finished, says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, what's the truth? God's word. John 17, 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them with the truth. Your word is truth. Remember how I told you, and I'm closing. Listen to this because you need to hear it. This is how crazy the Bible is, how amazing it is. 2 Corinthians 10, remember it, it said 3 through 5, it says, For though we live in a world, we don't wage the world. Contrary, we, we demolish strongholds. Remember? Here's what it said. Listen, it says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought. The phrase take captive minister, listen, it literally means to take prisoner with a sword or spear. To take prisoner with a sword or spear. And remember how we read in Ephesians 6, the, the warfare? We put on a helmet and then we've been given a sword of the... This word, Hebrew says, is living and active. Sharper than any double-edged. Why is it two-edged? Because when you put it in you, it goes and it cuts in you and it pulls out of you the lie and replaces it with the... Because I'm going to take it captive with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God the truth of his word. And as I close, listen, you need the truth to set you free. But listen to me, the truth is more than a verse. The truth is more than a passage of scripture. Honestly, the truth is a person and his name is Jesus. Jesus came full of grace and truth. He made his, the flesh, the word became flesh, John 1, 14, and made his dwelling among us full of grace and in other words you'll never be free without Jesus the first step to freedom for all of us is to come back to him and if you've never had a relationship with Jesus you aren't just fenced in with an invisible fence you are caged in in sin you need God to set you free through his son Jesus and for the rest of us today, we all need another altar call because we need him to turn. We got to get through the... We need Jesus who is the truth that sets us free. What do you mean, pastor? I can tell you that God loves you, but when you realize and have an encounter with the Jesus who loves you and you, you don't just know for God so loved the world that he gave his son, you realize that for God so loved Brian that he died for me and that he'll meet me at the lake. He'll show up and worship for me. He'll pray. He'll, when I pray, he hears me. He'll walk with me and talk with me. I begin to know again that he loves me and that love of Jesus begins to set me free. So what do we do? Identify the lie and begin to renew our minds by replacing it with the truth. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes, stand on your feet. Father, right now, I thank you that you loved us enough to send your son to die for us, not just for our sins, but to forgive us of our sins and even to help us begin to renew our minds so that we could experience the life that you have. But God, before we even can do that, we must be in relationship with you. So God, if there be anybody watching this morning or even later this week or even months or years from now on this YouTube, God, would you help them by your spirit to say yes to you? to say yes to you. The word simply says that, behold, that the God stands at the door of our heart and knocks 
and we just have to let you in by faith. If that's you, no matter where you are and you're saying, Pastor, I'm in the room or I'm listening or I'm watching and you know you need God in your life. You know you don't have a relationship with God or maybe you're not sure about your relationship with God, but you want to be sure. You want to live for him. You believe and you're saying, Lord, come in. That, that's going to be our altar prayer this morning. You want to know God. You want to be in relationship with him. Can you just put your hand on your heart wherever you are and just say, Lord, come in. Lord, come in. Come into my life. Come into my life. Make me new. Give me relationship with you. Forgive me of my sins. And help me to walk with you as the Lord of my life. And to know your love like never before. And here's the crazy part, church. If you've done that for the first time or maybe you recommitted your life Right now, you're saved. By grace, through faith, you are right with God. Not any work, not any goodness of your own. By grace, it's a gift that you couldn't earn. And a faith that you couldn't have on your own. And now for the rest of us who are watching or listening who say, Pastor, I am saved. I do have a relationship with God. Here's your altar call. I want you to put a hand on your head. And we're going to say those same words. We're going to say, Lord, come in. Lord, come in. Come into our minds, God. Come into our thinking. God, step into every neural pathway that is not of you. God, every negative thought, every fearful thought, every anxious thought, every depressed thought. God, I pray even for the chemicals in our minds right now. God, I pray that you would regulate chemicals to begin to even allow us to think properly. And God, we know that renewing is a process, but God, you can turn off the fence in a moment. That in an instant, in a twinkling of an eye, you can deliver us and so God I pray even at the beginning of a series that you would deliver now from depression and oppression and mental disorder and mental disease God schizophrenia cease in the name of Jesus every demonic spirit that is trying to attack the mind of your daughter of your son split personality disorder we bind you in the name of Jesus and we call you what you are not just a disorder but a demon from the pit of hell and so God we thank Thank you that you would help us to be and walk in the freedom that is the mind of Christ. God, you didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So God, now and in the next few weeks, my prayer is for sound minds. I hear construction trucks in the spirit realm. I hear bulldozers in the spirit. Beep, 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 beep. What's, what's that? that? That's God's spirit coming to change the thinking, coming to change and rearrange your mind to transform you through his word so that you may test and approve the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. If you believe that, can you shout amen? amen. If you need prayer for anything, we'll be glad to pray with you online, our online prayer team. If you need prayer for anything, we will be honored to pray with you right here at the altar. God bless you, church. Go out and have an amazing week in him. In Jesus' name.